of Science and Mathematics Faculty of Universitas Diponegoro. Honorable Dr. Susila Haryanto, SSCMSE, Head of Mathematics Department, respected all of lecture and teaching staff of Mathematics Department. To the Honorable, our speaker, Mr. Dr. Ibrahim Faye, PhD, Associate Professor at Department of Fundamental and Applied Science Center for Intelligent Signal and Imaging Research, University Technology, Petronas, Malaysia. To the Honorable, our moderator, Mrs. Ratna Heriana, MSG, PhD, and unfortunately, all of participants whom I love. First of all, let's pray and thank unto our God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has been giving us mercies and blessing, so we can attend and gather the meeting in this place in good condition and happy situation. Standing in front of you all, my name is Mega Permatasari. I am honored to be your master of ceremony on this special event. The sitting lecture with neural network for solving equation and image segmentation task as the topic. As your master of ceremony, I would like to read our rules before we are going to know our agendas. The first, participants are expected to join 10 minutes before the event start. Second, participants must fill in the attendance form that shared by the operator. Next, participants are expected to turn on their camera when asking questions or providing feedback. Participants are required to raise hand before asking and permitted to turn on the microphone after allowed by MC, moderator, or speaker. And the last, participants must wear appropriate outfit and expected, and expected to use virtual background that has been provided by the committee. We hope all participants can cooperate so that everyone can enjoy our meeting. Next, I would like to read our agenda in this meeting one by one. The first agenda is opening. The second agenda is welcoming speech. The third agenda is lecture and Q&A session. And the last agenda is closing. Ladies and gentlemen, before we enjoy our meeting today, Let's open our program by reciting Basmalah together. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much. Now we are going to the second agenda, namely welcoming speech. I would like to invite the Dean of Faculty Science and Mathematics of Universitas Diponegoro, Professor Dr. Widowati SSMSE, to Profido, to Profido, time is yours. Thank you very much for Master of Ceremony, Ms. Mitya Permatasari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning, everybody. Excellency, Professor Ibrahim Faye from Department of Fundamental and Applied Sciences, Center for Intelligent Signal and Imaging Research, University Teknologi Petronas Malaysia. Assalamualaikum Prof Ibrahim. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Prof Widawati. Okay. Thank you very much for your joining in this events. Ya, Mas. Excellency Farihin PhD as a Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs of the Faculty of Science and Mathematics. Di Ponegoro University. Dr. Susilo Haryanto as the Head of Mathematics Department. Dr. PT Ujiani as a Secretary of Mathematics Undergraduate Program. And also Ratna Herdiana PhD as a Moderator. Dear Lecturer at Department of Mathematics and all participants. First of all, let us give thanks for the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious and merciful God, because with his permission today, we can gather here to join together for the online events. On behalf of the Faculty of Science and Mathematics, I have the great pleasure to welcome all participants of the visiting lecturer events 
that's organized by the mathematics department, the faculty of science and mathematics, Diponegoro University. The aim of this visiting lecturer is in line with the goal of the faculty of science and mathematics to facilitate brainstorming and state of the arts information in fields of science and mathematics. As we know that the faculty of science and mathematics always support research and education developments in mathematics and its application. Several workshops, visiting professor program, and international conference have been implemented to promote Diponegoro University as a world-class university. We also support our students to gain an international atmosphere by conducting research and short-term study in other international universities. We always welcome international cooperation and collaboration to enhance mutual advantages in research and education. Therefore, we actively support the prospect of formal cooperation between the Faculty of Science and Mathematics, Hiponegoro University, with the Center for Intelligent Signal and Imaging Research, University Technology, Petronas, Malaysia. In addition, for today's lecture, the topic of the material is Neural Network for Solving Differential Equation and image segmentation tasks. I think that today topics is very relevant, especially for all students and lecturers in the Department of Mathematics. We sincerely thanks Professor Ibrahim for his attendance and significant contribution to promoting mathematics at Diponegoro University. Finally, by the grace of God Almighty and consent of all participants on behalf of Faculty of Science and Mathematics, I am as a dean hereby announced that online visiting lecture events with topics neural network for solving differential equation and image segmentation task is open. I encourage all participants to participate actively in the interesting discussion. Hopefully, that we are doing today is useful for our progress in the future. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof. Widowati, for delivering the welcoming speech. Okay, now we will move to our main agenda. But before we are going to the main agenda, I will welcome all participants to turn on their camera and be ready for photo session. I will give you two minutes to getting ready. Be your best version and the operator can be ready too. Okay, because I think everyone is ready now, so we can start the photo session.
Uh, we have two slides and we will start from the first slide. For the first slide, three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Okay. For the next slide, three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much uh, for all participants who are turning on their camera. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will going to move to our main agenda, which is lectured by Mr. Dr. Ibrahim Afaya, PhD, who will be guided by Mrs. Ratna Heriana, MSG, PhD. But before that, I would like to introduce Dr. Ratna, who will be our moderator. Dr. Ratna is a lecturer in Mathematics Department, Science and Mathematics Faculty of Diponegoro University. She finished her undergraduate on Mathematics in 1988 from Instituto Technology Bandung and hold double degree in Mathematics from University of South Wales in 1999 and hold PhD in Mathematics from University of Queensland in 2003. She has written about stability analysis of tuberculosis epidemic model with saturated infection force in 2020. Okay, without any further ado, please welcome Mrs. Ratna Heriana, MSG PhD. Mrs. Ratna, time is yours. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ms. Mega Permatasari, SDNC. A wonderful introduction. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. Um, a very good morning to everyone uh, attending this uh, morning uh, virtual visiting uh, lecture program. Uh, I would like to welcome our special guest, Dr. Ibrahim Afei from UTP. Um, it's an honor for me to be here again to moderate um, today's uh, visiting lecture. Uh, so, uh, as usual, before we start, um, let me introduce to you all um, the profile of our speaker today. I have summarized his um, long CV. So, we will get a brief uh, of his CV. Can Share the screen. Okay, Dr. Ibrahim Mafei. He um, has a position as associate professor at the posted at Department of Fundamental and Applied Sciences and also at the research center in UTP called the Center for Intelligent Signal and Imaging Research yeah, at University of Technology Petronas. The UTP is um, is at the state of Perak in Malaysia. That's uh, um, north of uh, the peninsula. Okay. Um, Dr. Ibrahim has a research interest in machine learning um, and very keen in image processing. Yeah. He has a background, uh, higher education, all in mathematics from the Bachelor of Science Master of Science and PhD in Mathematics from the University of Toulouse uh, 3 yeah, in France, all in France. And so he speaks uh, fluent French. Uh, he, uh, interesting, he also uh, did a um, master degree uh, in engineering of medical and biotechnology, biotechnological data at ECOL. Okay. Uh, his experience. Um, next. Um, currently, he is associate professor at UTP since 2013. Um, he was also head of the um, research group, Intelligent Medical Imaging Research Group. Um, and he joined Petronas since 2007, so he's been with Petronas for um, 15 years now, yeah, long time. Um, so his uh, Malaysia is uh, kind of his uh, second home, I think. Okay, 
he started as a teaching assistant in this University of Toulouse, yeah, in the early of his um, career. Okay, next. Uh, some of the courses that he taught in the, um, mathematics, uh, linear algebra, topology, uh, Fourier wave analysis, um, ordinary differential equation, and calculus. Okay, next. Uh, here is a book that he has uh, published, Introduction to Differential Equation. Also, he wrote a chapter of uh, two books here on machine learning applications and taxonomy of routing techniques in underwater wireless sensor. Okay, next. This is a list of uh, selected journal papers, the recent ones, yeah, uh, uh, published in reputable um, journals. Okay, next. He is also um, active as reviewer in a number of um, international journals. Yeah, and he also he is also member uh, of the IEEE Society in Malaysia, French. Yeah, so very active. Uh, and he also um, gained a number of achievements um, in his career. He received awards, um, research grants. And, um, uh, received patents from the Malaysian government. So, um, and of course, he supervised numerous uh, postgraduate students uh, in his uh, area. Okay, so um, so his lecture will be next. Um, neural networks for solving differential equation in image segmentation task. Um, the lecture will discuss. Uh, contain fundamental principles of neural networks with some illustrations. Um, he will introduce the deep learning techniques and example in med medical image segmentation task. So ladies and gentlemen, um, let us now pay attention to this lecture. Uh, Dr. Ibrahima, you have until um, 11, quarter past 11 on the time. Um, Feel free how you're going to manage your lecture. If you want to take a quick break or ask your questions to the audience, please do so. And to the audience, if you would like to post written questions, uh, write in the chat box. You can write in Bahasa also. Okay. Um, Dr. Ibrahima, the yeah. time and screen is yours. All right. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, just uh, to make sure, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all attendees. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Radna and the committee for inviting me, the uh, committee from the Department of Mathematics. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, and it's a very pleasure for me to be here, uh, to be the visiting uh, lecturer from your, to your university. Um, what I would like to do for this session, um, actually, I don't mind if there's, uh, if, if you can make it somehow interactive, that means if there's any question at any time, if I'm not able to read the, uh, the chat, maybe uh, Dr. Arna could, could help me out if there's any question, so I could just stop. Uh, what I mean by that is not necessarily to wait for the end of the, uh, of the lecture to ask questions if there are, there are any. And I, I like to ask questions as well. I hope you allow me to ask questions to the, to the yes, attendees. Yes, sure. Uh, yeah. so students um, get ready. Exactly. Pay attention. There yeah. will be some questions for you. Exactly. So it should not be one way. So I want it to be, to be interactive. Interactive, yes. OK, yes. okay so this is the, the title I have uh, chosen, uh, Neural Networks for Solving Differential Equations and Image Segmentation, segmentation Task. So which means over here, I'm talking about two different things. Okay? I will first go from the introduction to the neural networks, then show how it could be used 
for solving differential equations. So that will be, let's say, the first part of this lecture. The second part, we go a bit beyond the classical neural networks. So we look at the deep learning ne ne uh, networks, uh, deep, deep learning techniques. These are techniques that are there somehow improving whatever was there in terms of the classical neural networks. And then similarly, I will show an application of it, uh, which is the, in the case, in this case, uh, application to image, medical image segmentation. Okay, so this is the outline. After a brief introduction, I will talk about neural networks. So I just assume somehow that uh, some of you may not have the, uh, the fundamentals of neural networks, but it's not necessarily uh, something that, that is taught in, let's say, classical mathematics. Then how do we use it for solving differential equations? Then the next one will be the deep learning techniques. Again, this will be a kind of introduction, just going from the, the fundamentals of deep learning and then looking at how it could be used in medical image segmentation uh, before giving a conclusion of this talk. Um, uh, please, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me try again the full screen. All right. So let me start with just a, what we could call as a definition. Okay? So we use the terminology neural networks. The most commonly people talk about. Huh? Yeah. Sepertinya ada kendala ya, Bu, ya? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mungkin sinyalnya, sinyalnya kecil dari sana. Jadi terlempar ya? Iya, yeah, Ibu.
sedang saya komunikasi lewat WA ini nunggu baik ibu baik ibu Halo. Oke, okay, uh, we lost you. Oh. Yes. Oh, yes, really, really sorry. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, okay. All right. So, let me switch off my video probably for now. Yes. So that will help. It will be uh maybe it's heavy. That's right. Maybe that's one of the reasons. Uh then okay, I'm not sure where from where I was lost. Uh, just the introduction to start. Ah, okay. Let me share again. Okay. Uh, when I was talking about the history, that was I was still I was still on. Yes. Yes. It's still there. Okay, and then the applications. Probably I was lost from there. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so I was talking about the, the applications. So many applications like the banking, uh, business analytics, for each of them, I just uh, gave uh, one simple example. And then I just uh, underlined the two that I would be talking about in terms of uh, the illustrations. So we have application in medical, okay, medical image analysis in general, 
I'll be talking in particular about the medical image segmentation. And then in mathematics, just looking at how the neural networks could be used for solving differential equations. Okay, now let me just go back to the neural networks themselves. That means how they are built and what is the whole concept, okay, how, how it works. Thanks, just to illustrate again what is happening in the, in the brain and how it could be somehow uh, mimics. Okay? Try to get the same thing that follows what is happening in the brain. So what we have here is a set of, of input data. Okay? Input data, and then I will have some weights. We'll see these are some parameters. Okay? Each of this input will be multiplied with a weight. Then I have the sum of all these products. There's one parameter, which is the bias that I will show later on, okay? which it could be added. At the end, I have a combination that looks like this one, W1 times X1, W12 times X2, and so on. And I will apply a function. We look at these functions, why these functions are important, which is an activation function, and I will get an output. Okay? So this is the basic principle. Some input, I have some weights, where we'll just talk about parameters, I have the combination of these, uh, of these numbers. I will apply an activation function. I will get an output. If I have to go to the next level, this is, for example, what is happening in one of these, these nodes. Okay? The, inputs, uh, the inputs coming in, I will add, apply some weight and so on. Once I'm done with one, I could continue the same process. That means I can get output O1, let's say O2 up to Om. Then the same I could apply to the next level until my final output. Okay, just uh, in a very, a bit more simplistic. I have, let's say, for example, here, three inputs, X1 up to X3. Each of them will be multiplied with a parameter. This is the weight, okay? The WK as called the weight, XK at the input. Here we are just talking about three of them. I have the bias, I will use a function which is activation function. So the bias is just like you are having uh, one parameter extra. So that will control how, how far you can, you can be, for example, uh, from the origin. Then you apply the activation function and you get an output, okay? So this is the process. We are dealing with different parameters, W1 up to WK, and then we have uh, the, the B as the bias. Now, what can be done with one, one neuron? Okay? So in other words, I have some input, I want to see what I could do with it with I, when I construct a neuron in this, in this particular case. So for example, here, we just look at the B I was mentioning, the bias. So it helps somehow to see how far you can be from, uh, from the origin. Now, based on the weights, I could get a kind of construction this way. That means it's just like uh, it has two values, for example, zero or one, the output. Okay. So I can have a function which is like a plateau function, uh, or let's say a binary function. From this, from this construction. Now, the activation functions, you have a lot of them. The most famous are, are these ones. Okay? There are some reasons of it. We'll be probably looking at it later. Uh, the sigmoid, anyone who somehow works in this area definitely will uh, hear about this function, the sigmoid. It takes values, uh, the output will be between zero and one. The tan h, a bit similar, they're all increasing functions. And then it takes values between negative one and one. And then we have the ReLU, which is zero when X is negative and it is X when X is positive. But we have many more. We have a lot of uh, activation functions that could be implemented within, uh, inside the, the neural network. That means when we go from one level to the next one, what activation functions could be, uh, could be used. So if we talk about, for example, classification, if I have a simple binary classification, uh, one neuron could, could, could do it, could make it, okay? Because let's say I have simple linear classification, I want to be able to separate the data between two regions. So one linear, uh, linear binary could be made by using just one, uh, one, one neuron, okay? If we use the sigmoid, it could be 
counted or let's say considered as the first probability. That means if you look at the values over here, they are just between zero and one. So it could be looked at, we could look at it as a probability. Okay? So that means I could use it for classification. That means if I get, for example, two classes, if the probability is higher than zero five, then I will go to classify in that particular class where the probability is higher. Okay, so all these linear, linear problems, separation could be done by using only one node. So it's very simple, but it could solve some basic problems. That means I want to separate. And we have uh, all these, for example, or conditions x1, x2. I could have x1 bar and x2 with an n condition. That means x1 bar and x2 would be valid. And then another example, x1 and x2 bar. So by doing this kind of combinations, I should be able to do basic classifications, okay? just linear classification, just try to get a line to separate, for example, data between two groups. Okay, now this is when we use one neuron. Okay? Now let's say you want to get a bit more, okay? you want to use another neuron, you combine two neurons, then definitely the capabilities will be higher and we could be able we should be able to, to have more results in terms of uh, doing different types of separations, for example, of data. Okay, same input, different weights, because now I'm using two neurons. That means I will have a set of weights for the first one, a set of weight for the second. Okay? So I have more capabilities in that sense. So this is the type of thing that could be done, for example, separating and while combining, for example, uh, two neurons, I could have this kind of separation. That means I have different levels and I have different type of, of data. Now, if you go on this principle, okay, I could continue adding layers by the same principle. That means I have one neuron, then I combine two of them. I will have two neurons, then I could go to three neurons and so on. So I could keep adding. So this is, for example, a set of input. I will have here one layer, this is called the hidden layer, because this is when you start going inside the, the network. Okay. And I could have a next layer, same thing. So we'll have a set of layers, and at the end, I will get my, my output. Okay. The principle is still the same. I need bias. I need a combination of the weights. These will be the, the weights times the input. Okay. I combine everything, and then I will apply an activation function on it. Could be the ReLU function, any of the two the functions that I have shown earlier, until the last layer where I get the output, which works exactly the same, bias plus W, which is the weight, plus a combination of, uh, let's say, an activation function applied to X. Okay, so we could have a network. Instead of having only, let's say, one, I could have a full network. Of course, if I have full network, I will have more weights, I will have more parameters. The capabilities will be higher, and then the number of parameters will be higher. So it is a kind of balance. If I want to solve something complex, I need more weights, or let's say I need more parameters, and that I could adjust my function uh, as I want. Now it's called the fit for the net network is just when we go from one direction. I get these inputs, I set, for example, some initial weights. And with these weights, I will go to the next layer. I just continue the process until I get my final uh, output. Okay, This is fit forward, forward. That means I'm just going in one direction. And then we have the definition or the number of layers given. This is the depth. The number of units in one layer is the width. If I take one layer, how many nodes I have there, then I will just call it the width. And the number of layers I have within, so that will be the depth. Now, usually when we go for implementation or application, uh, depending on the problem that we are dealing, we could change the depth or, or the width. Now, if I have a set, a set of neurons, that means now I have a network of neurons, I will have more possibilities in terms of what I want to control, which kind of function I want to approximate. Okay, So that's why I could have not only uh, zero and ones, I could combine and get some shapes like this one because I have functions uh, being, for example, 
giving higher value and low value. And based on the weights, I could play, play with it to adjust, uh, to be as close as I want to, for example, a given function. Now, this is what was uh, proven and which is extremely important in this area, which is the universal approximation theorem, which was done in 1991. So what, it, what does it say is that if I have a single hidden layer network with a linear output unit, it can approximate any continuous function arbitrarily well, given enough hidden units. Which means I have a function, a continuous function. Okay? I want to use neural networks to approximate this function. And this theorem is telling us that if I have enough networks and enough neurons, I could always get very close to the, to the given function. It doesn't matter how complex is the function, but I can get close to it. Now, this is very interesting, especially for mathematicians. Okay. For people in computer science, yeah, it's, it's a good result, but uh, what can you do? Because this doesn't tell you how do you get the function. Okay. But for mathematician, mathematicians, it's extremely important because you are telling that if I have any function, it doesn't matter how complex is the function, as long as it is continuous, I can approximate it. I can get as close as I want to this function by using uh, enough number of, of neurons. Now, another point that we could uh, discuss is about, okay, this is for the mathematical point of view. Now, in terms of classification, how I can use neural network to do classification. Okay. Classification means I have, let's say, a set of data. I want my network to be able to classify between, for example, normal and abnormal images. Okay, of course, it will be based on some samples for training the network. The network will learn how to do this. At the end, it should be able to differentiate. I mean, say, given an input, what should be the output? Okay, and that should be based on some probabilities again. Then I will have a probability for each each of the classes that I'm dealing with, and I will classify my input based on the highest probability. Now, because of that, one of the most used uh, activation function at the end of the network is the softmax, softmax activation function, which is exponential AG over the sum of all exponential of AG. Okay, probably this one would be helpful to understand how it works. Now, let's say at our last layer of our network, we apply this activation function. If I have one parameter, or let's say two parameters, it should be exponential Z1 over exponential Z1 plus exponential Z2, which means as we are dealing with exponential functions, it is always positive, okay, this one thing. Second thing, since I'm dividing with something which is bigger, the value, the overall result will be always less than one. So it could be seen exactly as probabilities. So in other words, if I'm, Trying to get classification, this is, let's say, from an input. At the output, I'm getting this, which means I'm doing a classification task where I have five classes, class one, class two, class three, and so on. So I will decide to classify my input in class two because this is the one showing the highest probability. Okay, So that's the idea. This is how, how it works. Okay. So in other words, we could use uh, neural networks for approximating functions, we could use it for doing uh, classification tasks. And this is just to illustrate that it could be very complex. It could go depending on how many, depending on the width and depending on the depth, you could have a very complex network. But for feed forward, we, for work, we just go in one direction, okay? Going from one layer, go to the next layer until the output, the final output. Now, what is important if, for example, you want to improve our result, we need to use uh, what is called the cost function. So what does it mean here? I have values representing, let's say, for example, I have training set. I have a set of images, just to make it simple for understanding. I have a set of images. And I know, for example, image number one belongs to class one. Okay, Image number two belongs to class for example. Now, if I input image number one, I know 
in terms of the class, what should be my output? So I will get the output from the network and I will get the output from what I know that this is the class that uh, in which the image belongs to. Then I need to compare these two results. For example, here, I will do the difference between Y, which is the output from the network, and Z is the actual value. What it means by that, for example, if let's say the input belongs to class number one, let's say this value Z is one. And this Y would be a number between zero and one. So I could calculate the difference between Y and Z. Okay, I just take the norm two. So that represents the error. So the network will giving me is giving me a result, but the actual result should be Z. So I need to see the difference to see how good is my network. Another way of doing it is what is called the cross entropy. The idea is the same. I want to see the difference between the Y and the Z. Y being the value given by the network and Z being the actual value. Now, this is the whole idea is that I want to minimize this difference because I want my network to give me something close to the actual value. So that's the idea of back propagation in the sense that I have my output. Okay? So let's say I have X, then from X, let's say this is from uh, one layer okay? to the next layer, I have my output Y until the last layer, I have my output Z. Now, if I want to look at, to change the parameters, the initial parameters, I need to go back by using the derivative because I need to see how this X is affecting the output. So that's why we need to calculate dz over dx. Now, mathematics-wise, it's very simple. There's not much to do. It's just uh, normal uh, differentiation. Okay, this is just for two. If I have 100 variables or 100 layers, the principle is the same. Okay? As over here, if I have three, it's still the same. I just do the products. Okay, using the chain rule, I can go back to the initial parameter. Okay? Which means it doesn't matter even even if I have a layer like this. If I have my output here, I could do the back propagation until one parameter, which is at this level. Okay. And this is what is done in practice. So I have a set of data. I know that this data, the output is, the actual output is known. Let's say the Z as I showed earlier. The network is giving me Y. I do the difference. Now I want to do the the derivative of the difference, because I want to minimize it. So if I want to minimize, I need to find the, de the derivative, okay? So I need to get the derivative, set it to zero, and then see what should be the best value for getting uh, the, the difference to be as close as possible to zero. So that's the whole idea of back propagation, which is a, a fundamental tool in terms of improving your, your network. But there are some issues in terms of back propagation, in terms of how much you want to improve or how much you want to, uh, to change the weights. Okay. So what it means by that, I start with some weights, even could be arbitrary weights. Okay. Now, once I do, I calculate the gradient, let's say this is uh, delta, this is the gradient. When I go back to the initial network, to the initial uh, layer, I want to change the weights. So I will apply something like this. So the initial previous weight minus one factor, which is eta, or let's say the learning rate, times the gradient. Okay. Which means this eta will represent how much you want to change from the initial uh, from the initial weight that you had. Now, if you change it too fast, I mean you set an eta which is too big. This is as what is illustrated over here. You want to go over here at the lowest level. But then if you keep changing big with big values, you'll be missing it because from here, if you don't set a small value, you will shoot and it will go up. Okay? So you can be oscillating if you take a value which is big. If we take a value which is too small, you can reach there, but it may take long time. You go slowly a bit here, and then a bit there, a bit here, a bit there, until you reach the, the lowest point. So these are the kind of uh, balance that need to be found. It should not be too big, the learning rate. That means how fast you want to change your weights. It should not be too small. Now, in this particular part of neural networks, 
Okay, this is just a simplistic way of doing it. But actually, there is a huge literature which is only about the optimization. How do I optimize? How do I optimize this? So how do I get the, the, the best weight for my particular problem? And a lot of ways of doing it. So I don't want to go into those details, but I just have an illustration over here showing different uh, optimization model, um, methods. Okay? The most known is the SGD, okay? which is the, the gradient descent. And then you have some other améliorations, some other uh, improvements. And this one is just to illustrate how fast, I mean, in terms of convergence, which one is, uh, is the best. But this is a huge literature only for optimization in terms of neural networks. All right, uh, before I go to the next section in terms of solution of differential equations, is there any, any question from the audience? Any questions from the audience before moving to the next um, uh, part? Are there any rules how to choose? Yes. Anyone? Are, are there any rules how to choose uh, the function? Yes. Yes, Fadila? Not yet, miss. Not yet. All right. Okay. All right. okay. Thank you. Uh, let me move then to the next one. Uh, just to make sure, uh, Dr. Ratna, I have until another 15 minutes, is it? I, I could not hear just now uh, what was the time frame. That means now it's 11 from uh, my side. Is it 11? 11. 11? No, until 11 20. Yes. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, all right. Okay, now, next one is how do we use this idea of neural networks for solving uh, differential equations? Now, this paper is probably considered as the, the first one in this area artificial neural networks for solving differential equations, differential, uh, ordinary and partial differential equations. Okay. That means uh, maybe there, there were some works, but this one is uh, 1998, probably considered as the, the first one, which somehow uh, sets the rules or give the idea how we could somehow modify uh, a given problem, but we set it in a way that we could use neural networks for solving it. But the most recent one is this one. This was 2019, so it's relatively recent. On the, on the, based on the same idea, given a set of differential, or let's say just an equation, either ordinary or partial differential equation. So write it in a way that you could implement the neural networks. And they went a bit further to, to give some, for example, what they call now the physics informed neural networks. That means, can I get even the parameters? If I have some neural networks, I get some data. Uh, let's say I get some data. From this data, can I know what should be the right function with the right parameters that could be used for solving, uh, for getting this, uh, this, that, this output? Okay. So it's somehow a bit, uh, somehow uh, ex it's an extension, if I could say, framework for solving forward and inverse problem, problems involving nonlinear partial differential equations. And the other thing as well, they went from the algorithm Algorithm, algorithmic point of view, in the sense that uh, making some ports that could be used, for example, with Python, or uh, there are some other like Julia, these are different languages that could be used for solving these differential equations. Now, to illustrate the idea, I will just go for a very simple differential equation. Let's say here I have a second order differential equation which is linear, okay? I have initial value problem, I have initial conditions, mu of zero is mu zero and mu prime of zero is uh, mu one. Okay. Now, this type of differential equation, of course we have A, B and C parameters, but this one could be solved analytically. So we have the solution analytically. Now here the idea is that, can I write this in a way that I will solve it using neural networks? 
And then I could compare my solution using neural networks with the solution, which is the analytical solution. Okay. Now, this is a first step in the sense that I have already the analytical solution. I just want to check if my neural networks could give me a very good approximation of the solution. But of course, there are some other differential equations that we don't have the analytical solutions. Okay. But then this idea could be still implemented. That means I could get a result or get my solution, a numerical solution, and I could compare it with the other numerical solutions that are, that are out there. Now, how does it work? If I have this differential equation, I need to write it as an optimization problem because as you have seen just now in neural networks, at the end of my network, if I, I have some, for example, uh, some parameters that I need to, to update, I will have a cost function that I need to minimize. Okay. The same idea, if I just go back there for a while. Okay. When we do this back propagation, the idea is I want to minimize the error. Okay. So there's an optimization problem which is already included in, uh, in neural networks. So this is the idea that is used over here. I will, I will write this function by doing minus C. I bring the C in the other side, so that means equal to zero. Similarly, I want U of zero to be mu zero. That means I will bring it in the left side and set it to be zero, and same thing for U prime zero. But now the optimization problem, I want to write it as only one function, okay? Or let's say one uh, cost function. So I want this expression to be as small as possible. So that's why I do the difference, take the square root, uh, the square of this difference. Similarly, I will add u not uh, u of zero minus u naught. I want it to be as small as possible. So I just take the square so that they don't balance out uh, these numbers. And same thing for the last term. Now I change the name. Let's say u is the actual solution that we are trying to find. Here I write it with v, which is the best approximation I could get by using neural networks. Okay, so we'll find V as a neural network. And if you remember just now, we have seen that there's this uh, universal approximation. That means if I have a function, okay, if I have enough not, uh, neurons, I'll be able to get as close as possible to the function. So let's say here, I don't have the U, but I can construct this neural networks and it gives me a result as close as possible to the function that satisfies this differential equation. So that's the whole idea. That means we need to construct a neural network. We have X as an input. I have a network over here, depending on how many uh, neurons I want to have, how many layers I want to have. But the end, the output, what I want to get is V. Okay, a V that satisfies this expression. So this is what we need to minimize based on uh, the neural networks. And what it means by that is I need to give some input, different values of X. I will run the network. I want to minimize this and see what is the minimum value that could be obtained. That means that will represent the V of X. So if I have, for example, a given interval, okay, let's say we want, we are trying to find the solution within zero and one. I need to somehow go for this discretization. I will get some input data. I just have a set of points. The more I have, the better it, it will be because I will give a, a large uh, sample to my network. So each of them, I will set it as input. I will set X1 as input over here. I will run the algorithm and see what is the minimum that could be obtained. Then I continue the same process, X2, X3. At the end, I have the function V, which is the function which is approximated by the neural network. And that will be my analytical, or let's say my uh, numerical solution that I could compare with the analytical solution of the differential equation. That's the, the whole idea of, uh, of, of doing this. And why it works? Because when I have an input, uh, let's say I have my output from here, V, all these parameters, I can calculate them. 
again, based on this back propagation, because if I have X, it doesn't matter how many layers I have there. When I get the V, I could calculate the V over DX. The same way as I have shown earlier, by just doing the, uh, the chain rule, I will get some parameters between here, but I just have to differentiate step by step until I go back to the variable X. Okay. Again, doesn't matter how many layers are there. It's just doing the product of all these, these derivatives as, as I was showing over here. Okay. The same principle, our output is V, input is X. How many layers are there? It doesn't really matter. I just have to do the chain rule until I get the X. And once I have the first derivative, the same way I could get the second derivative and so on. So which means this could be implemented for any order. This is the first thing. And second thing is that we are doing it here for ordinary differential equations. If I have partial differential equations, it works exactly the same way. I will have more parameters, but I still can do the, the, the back propagation to get the derivative at any order regarding any of the variables. Now, this is the website where they have developed this algorithm and they even give some quotes that you could just uh, implement and run it on uh, using, for example, Python. Okay. So I will show a few examples that are taken from, uh, from this. The first one, we have a, a third order differential equation. We have initial parameter, initial uh, values, mu of zero, to zero, mu of one, sine pi, and mu prime of zero. And here we are considering that x belongs to the interval zero to one. So which means if I implement what I just showed earlier, I will do the difference over here, the second third derivative minus cosine pi x. This is the first term squared plus u zero squared, because this is minus zero, so it doesn't change, plus u of one minus cosine pi squared the same thing, and then u prime of zero, uh, again, uh, squared, okay? So once I get this, I will construct a network, and I want my network to get the minimum value possible. And you will get a solution. So you will have some stopping criterion. For example, you can say, well, I just run the algorithm uh, for 2,000 2, points. So I keep, keep running and try to minimize, and then, uh, you decide to stop, or you can set a minimum value in terms of the error. When I move from an error, uh, from a, a residual, which is a given value, where the difference with the previous one is that small, you can set a threshold to say, then I, ha I have to stop the algorithm. Okay. But classically, what people do is just you set a number to say, I will run it 2,000 times. So I set what is the, the minimum obtained. Now, this is how it looks like. If you compare the analytical solution with the solution from neural networks. Of course, this case is a very simple one, but it gives a perfect output in terms of you have overlap of the solutions. Okay? This is between uh, zero and one. That means the neural network is able to get exactly, for this case, the analytical solution. Sorry, how many points? You discretize zero, one? Yeah, this case, uh, how many points were taken? Not sure, maybe about 100, 100 points. Okay. Yeah. So Just, exactly. Yeah, it is really amazing in terms of how it goes with the, with the analytical solution. Okay, so if you go on something a bit more complex, we look at the Poisson equation. Okay, we look at this example, we have the second u over dx2, the second u over dy2, and in the right side, we have minus sine pi x, sine pi y. Again, we have boundary conditions, okay, between zero and, and one. So we, have, we are considering here that x is between zero and one, and y between zero and one. So that means, we, in this case, we do the same thing. I will have a first term here in my first function, I have a second term, third term, and so on. I will have altogether five terms, all of them power two. And then I want my network to make the minimization to get the, the smallest value. So I will set 
a set, uh, we get a set of points between zero and one, set of points between zero and one for X and for Y, and then run the algorithm. Again, there are a few settings that could be there. That means if I set, for example, uh, 20 neurons, or I set 100 neurons, the result will not necessarily be the same okay, in terms of uh, calculation, the time you will take for doing the calculations, and then how good will be your output. Now, this is how it looks like, the result. We have the analytical solution in the left side, the predicted from the neural networks in the right side. Of course, if I just look at it, it's very difficult to see the difference. Okay. But then over here, we can see the error. That means if we do the difference between these two, we can represent the error. So there are some, some errors are there, although they're not uh, clearly visible uh, if I just look at the, the, the plottings. Okay. But again, it gives somehow very good results in terms of approximation. And as I was saying just now, it depends on how many nodes you use, how many times you run it to, to get the minimization. So you could get probably even better if you go uh, a bit further in terms of uh, the running. Okay, the third example. Now we have one d dump wave equation with directly boundary conditions. So I have a second order, which is depending on x and on t. Okay. We have some parameters, C and V. And again, here we are just considering uh, actually C, V, and L, depending on the width that you are considering. But let's say uh, yeah, the width in terms of, uh, of X. And then uh, for, for example, here we consider T between zero and one and same thing for X. For the results I'll be showing, they are using actually these parameters. Okay, that say C, C equals to three, V equals to two, and uh, L equals to one. And then the principle is exactly the same. And this is something, one of the good things of neural networks. That means the principle is just, you do the difference, you take power two, and you want to minimize it. Okay, and then you run it, and you just uh, give it, uh, set it as four for your neural networks. Okay, so this is what is obtained. This is by looking at the, the 2D uh, plotting. You have analytical solution and then the predictive solution, or let's say the neural network solutions. We could see over here the error. Okay. Okay. Again, if you look at just the upper side, quite difficult to, to look at the differences, but there's an error that could be represented over here. And they have a good illustration. Uh, when you look at the variable T, so it shows the difference between the analytical and predicted solution. When you go higher, you have a higher difference, but then it goes down and you get values that are getting closer. I mean, the difference between the two is uh, less visible. Okay. All right, I think this is the Three examples I, I had for differential equations. Uh, on this website, as I have shown, they have more examples. You could be interested to have a look on it. And they have even some quotes that are somehow already uh, there that could be modified for your own differential equation uh, and then just run it to see how it works. So these are all illustrations of examples where the solutions are known. But as uh, you know, I mean, solution, analytical solutions are known. But there are cases where there's no analytical solution, but still you want to run to get something by using the neural networks, which is very interesting. All right. Now, the next step for this talk, I would first want to introduce the deep learning techniques and then show how it could be used for, for a segmentation task, or let's say medical image segmentation task, which is very common actually in uh, medical imaging. Now, I'll start with the idea of convolution. Okay? Convolution, just to make it simple, we look at, for example, an image. So each number here will represent, let's say, a pixel value. And then I have a weight. This time, the weight is not one number, but 
let's say it's a small matrix, could be three by three, five by five, seven by seven, and so on. Okay, so what does it do? I just take this weight, I will scan my input image, and I will do the multiplication. That means, for example, uh, the one here will be multiplied with 18, the zero with 54, and so on. I will get a result, I, will cut, I can store it somewhere over here. Then I move it one pixel in the right side. So I can scan the whole image from the left high uh, corner until the last corner, I mean the right uh, lower corner over here. Then I could get something with a dimension a bit smaller, but that will represent the effect of this weight on this particular image. Again, here the illustration is done with images, but we'll see later on that actually it could be implemented for any type of signal. Now, this is what you call the convolution layer. I take my image, okay? I have this filter, the weight here, I scan it through, I will get the output. Okay. This is as well illustrated over here, the same thing. I just scan from the left high corner until the, the last in the right side. Okay. Whenever I do the calculation, I will store it in a matrix which, which will be a bit smaller. Now, here, an illustration of it, but you can notice over here, the image here, or let's say my array here, it has a thickness, okay? This is just to show uh, somehow to highlight that what we are doing here is not necessarily in uh, 2D. So it could be 3D, could be a high, higher dimension in the sense that I have a thickness. So in general, in terms of image processing, the thickness here, the three just represent the three, the three uh, bands. Uh, red, blue, and green. So I have an image, I could look at it as three layers, which of them representing uh, one color. Okay. And then this is the size of my image, 32 by 32. If I consider a filter five by five, to do this process, my filter or my weight needs as well to get a thickness. So that's why I have five by five by three. But the principle is the same. I just multiply each of them, then move to the next, get the result and so on. Okay, so this is what could be done, and it's just to show how many parameters I have, because this uh, W will have, let's say, five by five by three, and then the image, initial image is 32 by 32 by three. I can scan it, I will get a certain number of uh, the dimension that I could be obtaining by doing these calculations. All right, so if I take 32 by 32, I do the scanning, my output is called the activation map. That means the result of this, of all this uh, convolution that I do, I will store it over here. Now, this is where I want to ask questions to the audience. Why at the output here, instead of having 32, I have 28. I start with 32, I run this filter, at the end, my, the dimension of my activation map or my, my output is only 28. Anyone has an idea? Students, are you paying attention? You asked, Dr. Ibrahima asked a question. How um, from 32 become 28? Eh? Okay, maybe oh. I let them think about it and then <laughs> at the end, I will go back to it. I'm so lost. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so this is the process or maybe I should I should give, should give the answer now. The, the idea is very simple is that I'm scanning from this corner. Okay, so I scan from this corner, I get a result. When I scan from the next corner, I will get another result, but I have one pixel that I already somehow lost. Because if I want to get the same dimension, 32, because this is five by five, okay, how many times I can have five within 32 by moving by one pixel? So that's why we are getting something less. So there are, of course, some techniques to, if I want to get the same, uh, the same dimension, 32 by 32, then I need to continue scanning by adding some extra zeros in the right side of the image. Otherwise, I will stop somewhere here 
and that will be somehow representing uh, the, the, the width of the filter that I'm using. So if I'm using three by three, the image size will be different. Five by five, it will be different. Again, it's just to say how many times I could fit this five by five into this image by moving by one by one. So I will get maximum 28. Okay, now if we continue this process, I use one filter, I get an image, an activation function. I use the next one, I get a different activation function. And these weights are not necessarily the same. That means I want to vary the content. For example, here I'm using 101. I could use another weight with different values. Okay, And I will get different uh, activation function. So when I do it many times, I will get by using many filters. For example, here, if I use six filters, at the end, I get a kind of stack of images. Okay. Now, this is just the same process showing how it moves okay, over the convolution, uh, the same thing. You could have different ways of doing it. Uh, this is what I was mentioning just now. I could add some extra rows, extra columns, so that I will get the same output image by just adding some zeros. Okay. This is one way of doing it. And this is an illustration of, you know, when I scan, I get the output. This is using one first, first filter. I scan again with another filter, I get another filter and I just connect all this. Now, why this is done? Because these filters will somehow give me some information about the image, depending on the way that I'm using. Okay, and the principle, the same as for neural networks. This is my initial input. I do the first convolution, I get this, depending on how many filters I have used, I will get a thickness over here. But I can continue the same pr principle. I could use another set of filters with having the same width as of this convolution layer, and I just go to the next one. Which means, again, it's just a kind of network. I do a first set, I get an output. I will apply some more filters, get another output, and so on. So that means the same thing that is in the neural networks could be done over here by just using the convolutional neural networks. Okay, so that's why we have the different name because now we are doing convolutions, not just multiplying with the with the weight. So this is just illustration of uh, the different steps. Okay, uh, feature maps is the one I described just now. There are something in between, like the special pooling. I will show it later, but this is the the idea. From an image, I will get different outputs and these outputs in terms of image, they are not, not that nice, but they carry some information. And this is what we are interested in. Okay, pooling is just, you are getting a maximum. Okay, this is uh, highly used in the sense that the size of the image might be too big, but I just want to keep the most valuable information from this image. So when I scan, for example, one three by three matrix, I just want to see what is the maximum value and I just store it somewhere. So this is the max pooling, okay? I'm just taking the maximum in a small box or three by three or two by two, and then I move, I can scan the image, just get the maximum values and I will store it. So that will somehow represent some information, for example, just about the edges in an image. Okay, this is just an illustration of it. I can just uh, do it differently. And now this one represents, of course, when I do this pulling, I'm getting the information, but I'm losing somehow in the term, in terms of the size. Okay, so I start, for example, with this image. If I do the max pulling, then I'm getting something smaller. Okay? In other words, I'm doing down something. But why we do it? Because now we want to get the information of the content, not the special position, but what is the information that is there? Now, this is the whole idea of uh, convolutional neural networks. And people try to start building. So you have very complex networks. Of course, if you have more layers, more elements, then you will have more information. You can extract more information at the cost of the computation time. Okay? But then it was a kind of, uh, I could say, competition where people just build different networks. The first one is uh, Linux 5, and then different modifications. And you can see all here the details, the feature maps, the size of the, uh, of the images, or the size of the filters, and so on. Okay. So people just build different ways. 
These are some other examples, okay? Just for you to have some idea about the, the names, but I will not uh, take much time of this on, on this. I just want to show this last one in terms of uh, networks, okay? Again, the idea here is just to construct for when I have an input image until my output image, what are the different steps I have to do in terms of the convolution, in terms of the max pooling, you can see over here the different uh, parameters, which type of filter I use. I could use even filter three by three, two by two, and so on. Okay. So this was published in eight, in 2015, and it was especially done for medical images. How to use these networks, for example, for uh, medical images, for doing in particular the segmentation. Now this is what we have used, okay, uh, with one of my students. Uh, with a very particular application, which is the osteoarthritis, okay? I will just call it OA, which is uh, a disease uh, very common, highly prevalence, a high prevalence in elderly. That means you have a cartilage between the bones, and if this cartilage is damaged, then it is very painful because the two bones somehow uh, will meet, okay? and that that causes problem, problems. This is the most common known on the knee, but it could happen at any other part uh, where you have a cartilage between two bones. Now, what is done in real life, it's mainly radiography by using uh, x-rays. But as you, you know, x-rays, if you keep having these x-rays, it could give some, uh, some issues in terms of uh, cancer or this kind of, of disease. So it is, in terms of imaging, it is, it is good, but it has some limitations. And one other limitation is that uh, you cannot use it for early stage OA. That means it cannot detect the early uh, problems that you have in, if some, someone would have in cartilage. Okay? So it could be used just when somehow it is uh, already uh, a bit advanced. Now, the alternative is to use the ma magnetic resonance imaging, okay? which is using a magnetic field to get some some images. So advantage is that it's non-invasive. There's no risk in terms of cancer for the MRI, no, no risk known. It's multiplanar. That means you can have different orientations. The only disadvantage is the cost. Okay, this is just to show the machine, uh, not going into the details, but at the end, you can get some images and it's considered like uh, good in terms of uh, how medical doctors could use it. Now, in terms of image processing, there are two groups. One is doing classification. For example, I want my model to be able to differentiate between normal images and abnormal images. And the second one is segmentation. I have an image. I want my model to tell me this part represents region one, this one represents region two, and so on. Okay, so this is a task which is a bit more complex compared to the classification, but which is very useful for uh, different applications in terms of uh, imaging. Now, when I have a model, the idea that I want to check how good is the model in terms of segmentation. These are some ways of doing the comparison. For example, a medical doctor has done the segmentation in an image and tells you this is the area. And then you make a model and the model gives you the one in green. So there's the difference. Now, you, have, you want to evaluate the difference to see how good is your model. One of them is the dice similarity coefficient, and you have some other ways of doing the measurement. So this one is just two times the intersection over the union. Okay, so it gives you gives you a, a value, and the, the 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 higher the better. Okay, to make it uh, a good a good approximation of the segmentation. Now, for the case that we have studied, is about the segmentation of the knee cartilage. And there are the four different regions that are there. Okay. The background, okay, this is just whatever is behind. And then you have the femur, the femoral cartilage, the tibia, and the tibia cartilage. Okay. So these are the four uh, targets. Okay. That means the medical doctor would like to have an algorithm that will give, even an image, will give a segmentation giving you all the details. So it can somehow, for example, know what is the thickness of this tibial cartilage, at least and have an idea. And from there, it could see what is the, the damage in terms of OA. Now there's a data set 
as you know, for these neural networks, you always need to train your model. That means the model will be given the output of the medical doctor telling that this is region one, region two. And we have this one done for many images. So the model will be trained and you, you can get some good weights. At the end, when the model is ready, then it should be used as uh, prediction. So whenever you give an image, based on the input, it will tell you this is the classification, or let's say for this case, these are the different regions. That means each pixel will be classified belonging to one of the four regions or five, if you can the background as well. Okay, so what we have done is just uh, the main, I just go to the main points. We use the 2D and 3D and some unit. I have shown the unit earlier, okay, which is a network for, uh, for image processing, for image processing, medical image processing. What we have done is we use the images themselves as 2D. You can have a network, you can get some result, and then you can use it as well as 3D. By 3D as well, you can run it and get some output. Now, what we do is here, we combine the results of the two networks. One telling you this is the output based on 2D, the other one telling you this is the output based on 3D. If I combine them, I will get a result which is a bit more robust. Okay. Okay. I will not go into these details. This is just uh, uh, showing the network that uh, we have used, the proposed method. I'll just go to the to the output. Okay. In terms of, for example, the DSC. Okay. So we just look at the different regions and see how good in terms of how close the segmentation proposed by our model compared to what we have as the ground proof given by, let's say, a radiologist. So it shows very good results. And this is uh, what we have published. Uh, it was last year, uh, 2021, uh, based on the, the data set that is uh, uh, freely available. All right, I think I don't want to go beyond the time. I just go to the conclusion. I'm reaching the 11.30. Now, what we could conclude here by looking at these two, these two types of uh, applications. Excuse me, doctor. I'm sorry, yeah. it's 11.30 our time, so it's 12.30 your time. Oh. We have one hour difference. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, I no went problem. too fast. Yeah. I, you you can uh, go slow. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I was uh, mistaken. Uh, okay, in that case, uh, because I read already the conclusion, uh, what I could do, could do, for example, just go back and show you some examples uh, in terms of the algorithms. Okay, anyway, let me conclude and then I will go back. So here, what I wanted to show you that there's a high potential of neural networks. So this could be either in terms of uh, looking at applications um, for engineering in terms of uh, image processing, all these are different ways. And that certainly some of them that are not really, uh, not yet explored, which means there's still a, a high potential for using the neural networks for different applications. Now, one of the issues that we have is that it's a, a black box is, issue. In other words, when you have your algorithm telling you, for example, uh, this is the classification or this is the segmentation, how this is done? I mean, what is the idea behind? Or let's say how to get the explanation of uh, knowing that the network will give you this particular area. So this is a, a black block in the sense that we are using some weights, some numbers, and at the end, it gives you the output. Okay. So now what people have been doing, not necessarily recent, but uh, it is one of the ways, is what is explainable AI. So that means I want to understand if my output, my network is giving me one result, I want to understand how it comes out to this result, this particular result. In other words, what could be the explanation of getting uh, the output? So for example, people look at if I do a segmentation, my output gives me uh, this particular region that belongs to, uh, let's say, this, this particular region. Now, how your algorithm is achieving this is based on what? So this is something that 
somehow it is uh, the next step. How do we understand the output given by neural networks? And this could be either in medical, even in, in maths, if I give a differential equation that doesn't have analytical solution, how the network is coming out with a solution and what is the, the logic or behind, uh, behind this, uh, this output. All right, I think that's what I, I, I had. Uh, but if we have time, then probably we could, you know, I start with maybe questions and if needed, I will go back and show some of the, the points that I have shown earlier. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahima. Very uh, interesting and um, uh, inspired um, lecture, yeah. Um, any questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. Uh, we have one in the chat box here, doctor. Right. But thank you um, for a wonderful lecture. I have a question from Pandi Ansori. Uh, we know that any optimization method has a speciality. In other words, powerful when solving some task. And oops, um, a powerful for solving some tasks and inferior or, or have some limitation for other tasks. For the case of A and N, what is its specialty? Specialty. So the advantage of A and N, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Fundy, I'm sorry, he's a young um, lecturer here. Uh, you want, would like to uh, directly ask the question. Do you understand, Dr. Ibrahima? Uh, not fully. Let me try to read uh, it again. Uh, just asking what, in the case of A and N, what is the its speciality, maybe the advantage, because uh, some methods are powerful, some have limitations. So what's in the A and N? Okay, so in, in general, um, for this particular case, in terms, for example, of solving differential equations, the main advantage is the simplicity. If you simplicity. compare, yeah, the simplicity. Mm -hmm. Because uh, once you have any type of differential equation, it doesn't matter how complex it is, you can just make the difference and then you want to minimize the difference that you have uh, from the right side and the left side. And whatever is, is there. So that is some, 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 somehow an advantage because if you compare it to some other analytical methods, it's a bit more complex. Sorry, some other numerical methods. So, so it's as simple as that. I mean, you, you just um, construct that um, optimization problem. Exactly. Just that. You, just, just that, and then you set in in, a, in your network, and then uh, and start giving the points. For example, uh, a set of points in the interval where you want to solve it. Somehow, this is the discretization. Give them many points, and then you run the algorithm. So this is one of the advantage in the sense that uh, it is simple in terms of implementation because the neural networks will do all the remaining, looking at for each input, what is the residuals and how do you get the, the minimum value from this and move to the next point and so on until you get your final output. But output is also numerical, I mean, not an, not an equation, right? Uh, the, the output, because at the end you have, for example, what should be u of x1, u of x2 for all the inputs data, you have exactly yes. the, yes. So discretize. Exactly. So uh, um, depends. Uh, the accuracy will increase if you have um, you discretize is a uh, fine discretization. That's right. That's right. So these are the two main factors to improve. Let's say uh, your output. First is the discretization. That means how many points you will consider. The second okay, point no is much. exactly. The second point is when you when you minimize because we cannot get zero exactly, but how far how close to zero you want to be. So depending on how you for example set a threshold that if I get 10 power minus 10, then I stop, or if I get 10 power minus 20, I stop. So depending on the criteria, yes. you can get closer to the, to the solution. 
but you uh, will get a, a smooth um, approximation. Yeah. yeah, especially if you have a lot of points in a given interval. I mean, the discussion is very fine. Then you, you could generate something very close to the, to the solution, to the actual solution. Um, how many layers that we choose if we want to? So there's no specific, uh, because it's kind of, you try, for example, uh, 10 layers and look at the result. So if it is not satisfactory, you can, you can add more, more layers. There's no specific. I think some of the examples no. are given. Yeah, no, no specific rules, yeah. It's mainly based on the experience. And some of these, I think they went up to 20 layers, for example, uh, to, get, to get their results. The results that I have shown earlier. Uh, yeah, Dr. Fandi, is that answer your question? Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Ibrahima. Uh, I just want to ask something, but have you tried the method, artificial neural network, in high dimensional uh, a system of ODE? Uh, I haven't done it personally uh, myself, but they there are some results that uh, some implementation of system of differential equations. And again, it works the same way. Uh, if I have a system, then I just have to difference all of them and then set it as my, my cost function and minimize it. Okay. Yeah, it, it has because been done, yeah. I have tried so many optimization methods to solve high dimensional a system of OTE, but many of them are failed to uh, find the uh, a, a great solution. Good okay, problem. thank you. Okay, welcome. Uh, just wondering, uh, when you say high dimensional, how high it is? How many? Maybe about a uh, hundred okay. dimension. Okay, okay. Uh, this one I, I haven't seen yet, but I think it's worth trying. It'd be very interesting to see if neural networks will give uh, better results, yes. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Okay, welcome. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fandi. Uh, another question here in the chat box, Dr. Right. Ibrahima, okay. from Faizi Muhammad Birfa. All right. Uh, very interesting. Uh, can you read in your chat box? This uh, is a long, uh, uh, basically, okay. if I change the dimension of the input, is it going to affect the final output at the end? Change the dimension. Uh, this oh, this is, is from, uh, regarding the image, yeah. Okay, this is from uh, Faizi, yeah? Yes, Faizi. Okay. Uh, change the dimension of the input. Is it going to affect uh, the final output uh, at the end? Uh, but, okay, this is about the second... Uh, okay, maybe let me look at the second part. Using 5 by 6 by 4. 5 by 24 by 1 instead. OK, yeah, so that could affect your, uh, your output in the sense if I take an image, I feel somehow we have done something similar to it. Now, if I take an image, I split it, for example, in four boxes. OK, and then I run the algorithm based on these four boxes. Or your um, I, your yeah? screen is not changed. Uh, no, actually, I'm not. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, but I, I could, I could show it in. Uh, let me just add one more slide. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. All right. 
I just try to uh, explain it over here. It allows me. Now I have an, an input. For example, I have an image. Let's say this is my image. And then I split it into four parts. And I set my network that uh, takes input one of these boxes. Okay, then this one will go in, then I will take the second, I will take, take the third and so on. It goes to the network, I will get some results. Okay. Now, instead of doing, just dividing by four, let's say I make it something a bit finer. That means I would look at patches that are a bit smaller. Okay, and then I do the same principle. So the output would be different because over here, I will have a network that is based on the number of, uh, let's say, pixels that I will have here. Compared to this one, it will be somehow bigger. Then I run it, I will get some other output, and the output would be, uh, would be different. And somehow, what we have done in the last example that I have shown, I did mention about the, for the OA, for the segmentation, we have used a 2D and then combined with a 3D. When we do the 2D, that means I'm looking at the slice. Okay, if you know the MRI is, uh, is a stack, it's like a volume. Okay? So when I go for 2D, I'm taking slice by slice. When I take one slice, I run it in my algorithm, I get the output. Then the second one, I'm using the whole stack as my input. For example, for the, the volume for one person, I use it as input to my network. Then I use the volume for another person and so on. Then I get different results. The result will not be the same. So that's why we do the ensemble combination. That means I will combine the result from 2D and the 3D. When I combine them, I get a better result in terms of robustness of my result. So the same thing will work if I use uh, a patch of size three by three, or let's say nine by nine. If I decompose my image based on these stacks, then I will get a different output in terms of the neural networks. I hope that answered the question, Sir Faizi. Oh, Faizi. Okay, thank you so much. I already satisfied with the answer you gave, bro. Okay, you're most welcome. Thank you. Uh, so he has a long question. Maybe you can uh, uh, contact Dr. Ibrahima later for further discussion. Uh, from yeah. Nur Cahya. Um, back to the, the neural network. In general, what are the factors that dominantly can minimize the error? Ah, like we mentioned before, the number of points. Yes, so if I have large number of points, okay, in terms of the differential equation, in terms of image passing in general, uh, or just in, in general, for what we are looking is the how many times you run. And uh, for example, if I run it 100 times or you run it 10,000 times, definitely the result will not be the same. Because if you remember the back propagation, I keep go forward, I do the feed forward, get some output. Okay, if I just represent it over here. So I have my input, I have my networks, and I have my output. Over here, I know that the result, for example, for classification, the result should be uh, Z let's say equals to one, and I'm getting from the network, I'm getting that y equals to 0 0.4, for example. Then I will do the difference, go back, change the weight, and come again. Maybe when I come again, I improve the y, the y, it become y equals to 0 0.5. Then I do difference, one minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5, I consider it big, then I go back, so, it depends on when I decide to stop. I could say I will do the feed, work, feed forward and then back propagation. I do it, for example, uh, 100 times. Then whatever is there, that will be my best dead. Or second option, I will set a threshold. For example, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. I will say while the difference is not 0 0.01, 0 0.01, I just continue, go back and and come again until I get 
this threshold, then I will stop the, the, uh, the algorithm. And then whatever is there as the weight, I will use it uh, as my output. Okay. So, uh, but the trade-off is the computational cost, of course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, it's not just the propagation method, right? There are other methods we can use to solve the optimization. Yeah, because yeah. You, you have, for example, uh, just doing the difference or doing the cross entropy, uh, as I showed earlier. So these are different ways of setting the, the difference between what you expect to get and what your network is giving you. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Nur Cahya, is that answer your question? Okay, thank you, Prof. Ibrahima. I think quite enough for the answer. You're most welcome. Okay. Uh, next question from Azril. Uh, I want to know about any algorithm or method to get ever more smaller. Is there a, uh, can we, uh, is there an algorithm that give a better um, approximation besides uh, propagation and forward propagation? No, I think these are the, the, the main, that means you do the feed forward and then you do the back propagation. Now, what could change somehow is uh, which type of optimization is used. As I, I had, I don't go into the details of optimization, but people do a lot of work on it in terms of uh, what is the approach. This is just uh, maybe four, four or five years ago. So I get get now. I guess now they have some other algorithms still based on the same idea. Oh, okay. So that helps to to get a, a faster. Gradient descent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The stochastic, stochastic gradient descent is probably the first one, the most, yeah. And then people do a lot of modifications by adding sometimes some more parameters, but then finding different ways of uh, getting the minimum uh, as soon as, I mean, the fastest possible. Mm, okay. because, yeah, if you remember, this was, let's say, a simplest way of showing it. You want to go here, then what is the best approach to go here in a way that it should not take too long, but you cannot take the risk as of missing the minimum as well. Yeah. Yeah. This could should should up and go a little higher. Okay. I hope um, that answers the question. Another question if I not in your medical image, I think you are. You use transfer learning method using UNEP, yeah. right? What yeah. is the benefit of the model? Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, actually, it this question will have two things. First thing is, why do we use uh, transfer learning? Yes. Now, the, the idea of transfer learning, let me just show one of the, the networks that was there earlier. Okay, I will start with this example, which is uh, very known, but sorry. Okay, let me start with this one, the ImageNet. So what was done over, over here is uh, we have this network and then we have uh, a large number of natural images. People were just sending image with the label. For example, I send images of bicycle, images of cars, images of trees, and we have the label. Okay, So this will be, let's say, a huge data set that could be used for training a model. Now, when you train your model in a very large uh, set of images, what happens is that your weights are well trained in the sense that you get an image and then you are telling your model that this, this is a car. So it will go through and it knows that the output 
should match a car. Okay? When you do it many times, because whenever you, you do the feet forward and then do the back propagation, and then you come again, you are improving the waist. Because when we do the, uh, uh, the back propagation, is just to change the, in the weight that we have. So we keep doing it until you get very good weights. Now, transfer learning, the idea is that I want to use these weights instead of starting from, for example, from this image net, which is just natural images. I want to use the weights to do the classification of my images. But why it is relevant? Because if I have an edge, it doesn't matter if the edge is coming from a natural image or a medical image. An edge is still an edge. So instead of me constructing my network from scratch with new, totally new or random weights, I will use the weights that are obtained from running on the image net. Because those weights are already well fit to recognize, for example, edges or recognize different types of things in, in images. So I will start from them. I just use it on my, uh, on my medical images. So this is one of the, the advantage of using, uh, of using the, uh, the transfer learning. Okay? You don't have to, to, to go from scratch. You use whatever is there, and then you export, uh, take the weights that are already well-trained on natural images, and then you adapt them to your case. Now, for the second part of the question is this unit, it was actually ba basically uh, built on the, on the idea of doing segmentation. So that's, that's the, the main idea. That means all these filters that you have or all these steps, the main target is that you have a large network, a, a large data set of segment, segmented images, let's say by uh, medical doctors, and then you train your network using these input data said so that your network will be well fit for doing any type of uh, segment, uh, segmentation, especially for uh, image processing, uh, sorry, medical image processing. So that's why it was already somehow having some advantage. Now the idea was just to use it and to adapt it in the case of the OA. And then we explore the idea of using the 2D combined with the 3D, just to improve uh, the results. I hope that answered the question. Um, Azril Bagas, does that answer your question? You would you like to discuss further? Azril, are you here? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahima, for your um, response on the questions. We have a wonderful um, discussion here. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, Asil says thank you. Okay, Any more questions, please? No, um, so uh, maybe um, just uh, uh, out of the topic, I would like to ask um, um, the possibility of um, doing masters in your um, department. But I, I know you, you don't have undergraduate uh, program, right? Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Yeah, just uh, postgraduate masters. Yes, yes, exactly. For maths, we have only postgraduates. Um, but you have many. Um, uh, what do you call? Um, uh, from overseas, right? Uh, yes, yes. We have uh, our master, the master and PhD. The majority is uh, foreigners. Yeah. And the undergraduate is the other way around. Scholarship are is still available. Uh, many you provide many scholarships. Yeah. Okay, somehow we have some uh, reduction in terms of the number of scholarships. So we used to have uh, four scholarship. Uh, every one of us, I mean each of us, all the lecturers will have four scholarships, and now we change it to two. So 
Oh, okay. Yeah, we have mm. two, two available positions for each of us. Okay. Yeah, so, we can be master or PhD, yeah. Yeah. So anyone interested in this area, um, maybe want to browse and see opportunities um, doing your master's in the uh, UTP? Yeah, sure. sure. You have a program as well uh, in your department. Undergraduate, uh -huh. postgraduate. Do you have a postgraduate or undergraduate program in mathematics? Oh, yes, yes. We have okay. uh, most uh, students are from the undergraduates. Uh, master's program, uh, a small number. Not, we try to increase the number. Oh, but it's a course a by course, not the research in okay. UTP by research, right? By yeah. research, that's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. But if it is by uh, on coursework, you still have an uh, element of research uh, in it. Yes, right? yes. They okay. write a thesis. That's right. At the final uh, year, yeah. Okay. Yes. So I hope we can uh, uh, collaborate in some kind of research together. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, yeah, we'll be happy. Yeah. And um, you know, actually, next year we have an international conference offline. So okay. I was hoping I can invite you uh, to come here. Is it? Ah, I'll be very happy to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I shall. Uh, next year we have international uh, conference. You know, in Svinsa, we did yes. that. Yes. Okay, yes. So we're going to have it on offline next year, and um, mathematics department is um, have the uh, uh, rotate, is in rotate the committee okay. uh, it's, uh, with the math department next year in Sarawak. Okay, so I will contact you maybe next year. Yeah, inshallah, yeah, I'll be happy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the okay. meantime, what could be done is for uh, those who might ent be interested, because this tool of differential equations, as you can see, uh, let's say the latest paper was 2019, maybe there are some in the 20s. So it's really a hot topic in terms of the applications. So yes. if any of the master students want to do uh, his project in this area, I'll be happy to help out. And for the undergraduate, if they want to go for a, a master in this topic as well. Yes. Yes, and definitely we can. Some undergraduates do their final projects, also uh, topics yeah. in neural networks, but simple uh, applications, okay. yes. Yeah, this could be a good good uh, implementation as well for the final year as well, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, any questions before? Okay. Uh, Fadila, raise question. Uh, raise your hand. Yes, thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Ratna. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask about uh, a question that's not really related into today's lecture, maybe I'm, I say it from the perspective of your journey in mathematics or your experience. Uh, I want to ask about maybe the application of the mathematics itself uh, for you. What is the most potential thing from mathematics that can be applied into politics? Because uh, I've got an assignment from last semester. Uh, it talks about bipartisanship in United States Congress. And that's really interesting for me. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's from graph theory. So uh, from your perspective, what is the most uh, potential thing from mathematics that can be uh, applied to politics, politics world, and how can that be influential or potential? Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much. It's a very nice question. Yes. And uh, very challenging for me, <laughs> but uh, I will try to give uh, my perspective uh, on it. Um, there was actually a work that we have done recently. Uh, I wouldn't say it's purely mathematics. Of course, there's still, uh, let's say, if you talk about prediction and all this, so we still have some elements of, uh, of mathematics in it. But this was somehow combined with uh, the behavioral sense, in the sense that, uh, you know, before, for example, elections, the, pres uh, the candidates, they want to know what people think about them. So 
how, for example, you can have a right estimation, right? not talking about the polls, because that would be something aside, but having the real um, estimate, that means the real state of people, how they think about you, uh, about, about a politician. Now, one of the extension, but this is still based on, uh, on this topic about either uh, machine learning or let's say deep learning, uh, there's something called the sentiment analysis. So for example, you go to a forum and you get the, the chat when people write something, some comments about, for example, a politician. So this could be analyzed by using uh, the neural networks or any type of uh, machine learning techniques. So that at the end, you can have what the people or what people think about this candidate. So that means you don't need to have someone sitting there and reading all of them, but you just collect it and send it to your network. And your network will tell you at the end, based on the elements, the keywords that have been used, if this is a comment which is positive for this person, or it's negative and so on. So at the end, you can have an automatic assessment so you can imagine a politician just sending people uh, into different websites and getting the sentiment analysis done on these websites. So from there, you can have uh, an, an, an idea about what people really think about you, because that will be beyond the, uh, let's say, the classical pulling that uh, pulls that are done uh, for elections. So this is what I could think about uh, on the side, because of course, all these deep learning techniques, there will be some mathematics behind because they are actually based on math, math and, 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 uh, and, and statistics. Although in terms of algorithm, then you have to go to the computer science, but the base is still uh, something mathematical. This is one, one example that I could think about uh, right now. Uh -huh. Interesting, Vadila. <laughs> so can apply yes. in um, social. Yes. Yeah, I uh, actually, if, uh, sometimes we've heard about the uh, machine learning or that kind of stuff. But uh, for me, myself, I think I haven't heard a lot about politics that is related into mathematics. And I'm glad I can uh, hear it from uh, Professor Ibrahim Afaye. Thank you for the answer. And uh, the end. Yes, a good insight. So, so you can do like survey without actually um, go to the people, right? Yes. By online. Exactly. Yeah. So nowadays, there are a lot of forums where you can just join the forum and then you can get the, the chats done by many people. So it could be analyzed automatically. Yes. And avoiding um, bribe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay, I think uh, we have come to the end of our discussion session. Um, very uh, interesting and I enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahima. We um, obtained uh, a lot of knowledge from your lecture um, on uh, neural networks, applications in uh, differential equations, and of course, the deep learning introduction, deep learning techniques, and the application in the medical image processing. Uh, okay. Um, So if there is no uh, more question, so we end the lecture session. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, I will wait, <laughs> hang on, doctor. Um, okay. I return this back to the MC, Ms. Mega. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Ratna Haryana for guiding us through the discussion session. And thank you also, also, thank you for our speaker, Mr. Dr. Ibrahim Afayo, for a very insightful presentation and wonderful discussion. Okay. Before we going to the next agenda, I would like to remind all of participants to fill in the attendance that has been shared by the operator in the chat box. Okay, maybe uh, if the operator 
uh, didn't share, I would like to share. So the attendance from uh, now already in your chat box, everyone. Okay, now we are going to the next agenda, which is giving certificate and thank you note to our honorable speaker, Mr. Dr. Ibrahim Afaya, by the head of mathematics department, Dr. Susila Haryanto, or the representative. To the honor, time is yours. Thank you, Mbak Mega. Bisa dibantu share sertifikatnya. Mm -hmm. Bisa, Ibu. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Alfaya, Department of Mathematics, would like to say thank you very much for your interesting topic today, for your time, also for your sharing with us. Hopefully in the future, Dr. Ibrahim is willing to be invited again with other topics. So as a thank you, please accept a certificate from us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. Uh, it was a good pleasure sharing with you and hopefully we have some other options uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, offline, if I could say. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, next year, doctor. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ibaima. Uh, apa? Uh, please, Mbak Mika. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Titi, for representing Dr. Susilo for delivering thank you not. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, finally we are going to our last agenda. That is closing. Okay, let's close our program by reciting Hamdalah together. Alhamdulillah, Alamin. I would like to say thank you to all of guests and participants for attendance to this visiting lecture. And thank you for active participation and also attention during our event. I am your master of ceremony representing the entire committee. Apologize for any mistake, mistreatment representing of all on this event. I would like to say thank you again to all of participants, speaker, and our moderators. See you on the next visiting lecture. Thank you very much for your kind and nice attention. The last I say, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Thank you everyone for standing. Uh, thank you, as uh, well. you. Thank 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 Alhamdulillah. Mas Wadil, ini ngane Mas. Kayaknya saya minta buru-buru apa uh, ini uh, absensi dan apa Mas uh, rekamannya ya Mas. Ini sudah diminta SPJ-nya itu. Di, <laughs> ini akhir semester ini Mas. 
ini sebetulnya bagian keuangan sudah nggak mau terima tapi saya minta waktu untuk untuk ini <laughs> untuk oh, bisa iya. dimasukkan ya maaf ya Mas Adil selalu repoti ya Mas nggak <laughs> apa Bu terima ya. kasih Bu itu terima kasih banyak ya Mbak Mega Mas Adil buat